be operating, it's also the place with the least certainty. Uh, if you repeat someone else's experiments in the laboratory, you can probably make progress uh, very steadily. On the other hand, no one's going to be very excited about the results. So if you're operating in totally uh, new frontier territory, there are no guarantees about how long it will take to understand the system that you're trying to understand. Uh, and certainly persistence is required and and also flexibility that one has to, uh, if your first approach to a question doesn't bear fruit, you have to be flexible enough to do an end run and attack the problem from a different direction rather than continue hitting your head against the, the same wall all, all of the time. But I think those sorts of frustrations are not uh, particular to molecular biology, I think that uh, most of the sciences, that, that, that science in general has, has that sort of a, a drawback. And it takes a type of personality uh, who can be a person who can be simultaneously patient and impatient. You have to be willing to work for a long time to get to a result so you have to have patience, but also you have to really want to get there, and so you have to be, um, uh, at, the, at the same moment, an impatient person. Yes, down in front. Why did, why did you heat the, the sodium tartrate? Was it to increase the rate of reaction? Yes, that's a good question. Why did we see heat the sodium tartrate? It was at about uh, 50 degrees uh, Celsius when we... Uh, started the reaction, and, and you're absolutely right. It has to do with the rate of the reaction. Many reactions um, will occur more rapidly at a higher temperature, and in this case, we uh, were able to speed up both the uncatalyzed and the catalyzed reaction. Now, you, say, you may say you didn't see the uncatalyzed reaction speeding up. Well, we didn't have a sensitive way of monitoring the very small amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide that was being uh, evolved in that reaction before we added the catalyst. But had we been able to do that, you would have seen that the uncatalyzed as well as the catalyzed reaction would speed up at the higher temperature. Additional question, yes? What is the catalyst in the purification? So the question, so the comment was that you've purified DNA in the laboratory and, the, and you're interested in the catalysis of that. Well, the, the in, during the purification, there isn't a, a catalyst during the purification, but the cell uses a catalyst to build the DNA to start with. And so that's called a DNA polymerase. A polymerase is an enzyme that strings together the individual, what we call monomer units, to make a polymer. In the case of DNA, the monomer units are the nucleotides, which are in the form of A, G, C, and T, are the four building blocks. And they are strung together um, by an enzyme called DNA polymerase using a pre-existing strand of DNA as the template that determines the order that the nucleotides are laid down. So the catalysis, in fact, uh, involves not only the enzyme DNA polymerase, but also a pre-existing chain of deoxyribonucleic acid. In the back, in the gray sweater. Um, since RNA is coded from DNA, um, wouldn't DNA then have catalytic properties if RNA is coded from it? So that was a very perceptive question, that if uh, RNA has catalytic properties, why not the DNA? that encoded the RNA. What's so special about RNA? In fact, uh, DNA in its single-stranded form has been recently shown to have catalytic activity. Uh, for example, Jerry Joyce at the Scripps Institute in Southern California has done some nice experiments along those lines. Uh, I think that the way that DNA normally occurs in the cell, locked into this very regular double helical structure, is in part something that has occurred in nature to prevent the DNA strands from folding up by themselves and performing interesting reactions such as uh, catalysis. Because when you want a, a very secure stronghold 
a very safe place to store information. You don't want reactions to be taking place uh, in the genes themselves. And so by locking the DNA into the double helical structure, it's prevented, the two individual strands are prevented from folding up into shapes that by themselves might be able to perform catalysis. As you'll see in the next lecture, one type of catalysis can be self-catalysis, can be cleavage of a bond within the same molecule. And the last thing we would want our chromosomes to be doing would be to f for the strands to fold up and catalyze their own cleavage or rearrangement in an uncontrolled way. But you're absolutely right, from just, chem just from a chemical basis, uh, RNA is not that different from DNA. It does have an addition, as you can tell from the name, deoxyribonucleic acid is missing what kind of an atom? An oxygen atom on every one of the building blocks. So RNA has an extra oxygen atom. It's actually in the form of a hydroxyl group, an OH group. And that does give RNA additional reactivity and additional structural possibilities relative to DNA. But it's a fairly small difference. And so if RNA can be a good catalyst, you would expect DNA should at least be able to be a fair catalyst. Question over here. Um, this is kind of related to the last one, but is it that extra hydroxyl group that allows the, the RNA to form the different structures? And why do the different kinds of RNA form the different structures? So the, the first question was, is it that extra hydroxyl group which allows the RNA to form structures? And the answer is that, it's the, the, that that is one feature of the RNA that allows it to uh, form a very particular uh, sort of a globular structure that can act as a catalyst. But other interactions, such as pairing of the bases, complementarity between A and U, G and C, also is uh, another sort of interaction that's very much involved. And your second question was? Was the, why do the, the different kinds of RNA, like why does the TR, is that the, the arrangement of the nucleotides that makes Exactly. So, so the question is, why do different RNAs that have different functions, how do they know how to fold up in a different way? And the answer is that the, what we call the primary structure, the first level of structure, which is the order of A's, G's, C's, and U's along the chain, which is, of course, determined by the DNA from which they were copied. That order determines the way that the RNA folds and pairs with itself. And if you change that order of A's, G's, C's, and U's, you will perturb, perhaps in a, in a useful way for some other process, the way in which the RNA folds. Thank you very much for your excellent questions. I'm sure we'll have time for some more later. Thank you, Tom, for a wonderful first lecture. We're going to take about a 30-minute break, and then we will come back for the second and final lecture of today. Uh, Tom will take up where he left off and tell us more about his research on catalytic RNA. The title of his second lecture will be RNA as an Enzyme, Discovery, Origins of Life, and Medical Possibilities. But <music>